Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Curious Competitor Podcast. I am here with the big tuna uh, ex-roommate of mine is a Hershey Bear, uh, Liam O'Brien. A uh, couple highlights coming up on the podcast today. One is just talking about Liam really being the ultimate teammate. Uh, he was that to me. Uh, he's, he's still a brother to this day. I'm convinced that if I called Liam and said, hey, I'm in Charlotte, man, but you know I got to move places. Uh, I need you to carry a couch six blocks down the street to my other apartment. Liam would be there. Um, he's had this a uh, couple streaks in his career where he's you know created his own luck, uh, given a short hand in, in training camp and things like that. Found him, himself on on a on a heavyweight Washington Capitals team as a young guy, and, and that was kind of we'll we'll start the podcast off with that. Um, and now he's he's gone on to play uh, with the Colorado Avalanche and, and currently with the Arizona Coyotes. But Ob, I want to talk about. We can talk about your time in the queue and some of your youth hockey um, a little bit, but where I really got to know you for the first time, it was uh, 2014, 2015, right? was the year, because it would have been my second year, your first. Uh, Barry Trotz was coming in. He was uh, the newly appointed head coach of the Washington Capitals. And you came in for development camp without a contract as an undrafted free agent. And through every nook and cranny uh, that you could find any, any little breadcrumb worth of ice time that you could get during training camp. You found yourself on the opening night roster. How did you do that? (laughs) Uh, It's funny, man. I mean, I think I just was having a good time. I was, it was a day to day for me. Um, It was, it was a whirlwind. You know, you you go from being a 20-year-old in the Quebec League to, you know, you're at camp, then all of a sudden you're in an NHL preseason game wearing an NHL sweater, playing alongside Alex Ovechkin, Nicholas Backstrom. You know, I think I was on a line with uh, Kuznetsov. (laughs) So I think that helped me a lot. Um, But I just had nothing to lose. Um, And... Sometimes I think that's a a good scenario to be in and I wanted to prove myself and I wanted to prove that I could be a pro hockey player. And, you know, I think Barry saw something in me, which, uh, you know, to this day, I'm, I'm, you know, forever grateful for him for giving me that opportunity. Ultimately he, you know, continued to put me on the ice, uh, continued to put me in preseason games and, um, yeah, you know, I you know, had a great camp, but uh, not many guys in my situation going in as a uh, yeah UFA, I guess you could say. Uh, you know, you don't you don't get those opportunities. So I was just grateful that uh, he gave me that shot. What were some of the highlights of that training camp? Because I, I think the one game didn't you have a Gordy Howe, and then you were. You know, banging think, on Zach Ronaldo's door, asking him to fight. Yeah, I had. I think a camp. I think it was. I think I played five games. I had. I had four tilts and four points or something. So I. I the first game, I believe, I fought. I think we played Philly. I think I fought uh, Derek Mathers. You remember that yeah, guy? Yeah, I remember that name. Big meat and um, had an assist. John Erskine, I just kind of went low to high. John Erskine put one in from the from the point. Bang, first assist, no problem. Yeah, first assist. And then after that, we played against Boston. That's when I had the Gordy, fought Bobby Robbins. And then after that, Philly again, fought Ronaldo. And I believe I had another assist. So, um, yeah, got to play against Montreal too. Went, went to the Bell Center, played against Montreal, which was a cool experience. Uh, even in preseason, you know, like it's you know, jammed. So overall, that camp was just unbelievable. I mean, I, I, well, I was and just people, rolling. <laughs> I think it's funny to use the term. It's something that people say a lot, right? Like, hey, how you doing? And people say, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm day to day, right? Um, I don't think the listener may totally uh, be able to understand when you're in an NHL training camp and, and you are on the outside looking in trying to make the roster every single day you're coming to the rink, you're just checking to see if your gear's in like a garbage bag. You're just trying to see if you have 
you know, uh, you know, a, a name card in the stall. Like you're leaving the rink the day before, trying to see if the trainers are like, you know, packing up anyone's gear early. Like you, it's it's day to day in the truest sense. Hundred percent. I mean, they gave me number eighty seven. <laughs> they gave me number eighty seven for a reason. They're like, this yeah, which, guy is this guy's going to be gone in the first couple of days. Um. So I think that was that was cool for me too. It was like, you know, here I. I remember getting there and like, I got number 87. I'm from Halifax, right? You know, Sid, Sid's from like right across the bridge. And I got people from home being like, you know, what the hell are you doing wearing number 87? Like, who do you think you are? <laughs> right. But people that don't understand, right? People taken, understand yeah. like, yeah. <laughs> I never picked that number. That would have been the last number. I would have picked 99 before I picked 87. Yeah. Double zero. Double zero. Yeah. I thought this was super cool. I remember Barry Trotz talking in his uh his opening presser. And they were talking about how Liam O'Brien it was a big story. You know, the Washington Capitals offered him a contract. I know they weren't the only NHL team to offer you a contract during that training camp, which is kind of cool. It, it kind of an, an obvious reminder that you are always being evaluated as a player by everybody at, at any given time, all the time. Um but Barry talked to the media and basically uh, admitted, it's like, yeah, you know, we work with like a travel agency to kind of send guys down and we have, you know, tabs on kind of who's expected to stick around week by week. And Liam O'Brien had a ticket, you know, back to Halifax after, you know, the first week of training camp. And uh, as, a, as a club, we had to decide to rip that ticket up and, and go a different route. And uh, do you do you remember watching that press conference, or did he tell you that privately? Uh, I remember seeing that. Yeah, I mean, he 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 was awesome throughout the whole process. Like, you know, I think the first night when I had my my assist, you know, he brought me the game sheet. And then he brought me the game sheet again the next game when I had the Gordy. Um, and then you know, then my first game. So he, yeah, you know, he, you know, it was awesome. Yeah. What is actually, I want to stay on that. Cause I, I was in, this is pretty cool. What is the coolest piece of like memorabilia you have so far from your career? Like what's something you're most sentimental about other than the bobblehead you were showing me from your days as a, as a Hershey bear, believe it or not, right, I was before playing we started recording midget triple a, I think this is just the funniest one I keep. Uh, I took a skate across my ankle and I was bleeding like all over the place. It, it, they took my sock off my, my foot and my coach was like trying to keep pressure on it. And he raised the towel for a quick second and it hit a nerve. So it was splurting all over his suit. Ugh. Disgusting. Right. Anyways, I have my sock from that game still. It's like, wow, drowned, drowned in blood. And, um, so I still have that. That would be one of the funnier ones, huh, like cooler cool ones. Um, and then, you know, obviously your first goal. That's, that's you know, the yeah, coolest moment, I think, in anyone's career is your first goal. I mean, obviously winning the Stanley Cups, probably better. But after that, you know, your first goal. How did you score your first angel goal? Uh, low high, it was in van, low high, Mike Green, shot, pa uh, shot pass, tip in the slot on uh, Miller. Ryan Miller, yeah. ever heard it was of actually him? like it was pretty good. It was a legit goal, you know, like it, it was wasn't. a real goal. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was it a wasn't real like goal. a fake goal like mine, where it was out of the penalty box after yours was, a break. Yours was nice too. You were out of the penalty <laughs> box, which is I like, one of those end, you don't get many breakaways. I've been in the NHL nine years. I haven't had, I think the last breakaway, like clear breakaway I would have with that kind of length would be, I know I'm wrong. I'm, I know there's one I'm forgetting, but I, like the last one I really remember was like me staring at the goalie was World Junior. I blocked a shot on a five on three and went down on Zach Vicali and went, did the same move actually. And he just got his like steal on it. Yeah. yeah. Lost Team Canada. I think we lost three to one if I had to remember in the round robin. When you take a penalty, the second you get into that penalty box, you're praying. You're praying that you get that, you know, high flip into the neutral zone, perfect timing, 
breakaway because it's like redemption, you know, like you take like, let's say you take a stupid penalty or something. It's like, all right, like, come on, come on. Universe. Just give me like, something. Give me yeah, that let me get high back. flip. <laughs> What's that? Just get, just let me get back to even. Let me, yeah, like, let me let make me, Coach like, happy here and bury I one. I need it. I need this redemption. So help me through. So that first year, what'd you play? I think it was like 15 games, right? Uh, to start the year. And then after that, you know, Washington was a tough roster to make for a long time. Still is. Yeah. Uh, if you're a forward trying out for the Washington Capitals, it's going to be, you're going to have to go, you know, rub elbows with some heavyweights uh, and really carve out a niche, you know, in the bottom half of that lineup because a lot of their big minutes are eaten up, right? And even their support roles have been pretty solidified just with the success they've had year in, year out. Um, take me through the next couple of years. A uh, lot of time in Hershey, a lot of time sitting there, you know, because I've been there, right, where you get, you get a chance earlier in your career and then you're in the minors for a year or two or three and you're doing well, but you're or wondering four, like, or five, how or, six. or five. <laughs> and you're like, how well do I got to do to get a different look? You know, there's the, there's a the UFA system where you can't be a free agent until, you know, you're a certain age, you know, help me understand what it was like still trying to believe in your game, still trying to, you know, bottle that magic that you came in with, right? Because it, it's nice, man. Kind of when you come in and you're that shiny new toy and you start out hot, you know, coaches, managers, they get excited about you. They think they found the new gem, right? They, they found the diamond in the rough. They want to be right. Uh, but then, you know, they send you the minors and you can get forget, forgotten about a bit down there. For sure. I think, you know, I played those, it was 13 games. And then I got, I got sent down and I forget it. Barry came up to me on the plane and said, and it was kind of like, there was a few guys around when he said it too. It was like, Hey, we're going to send you down for a couple of weeks. You know, like we'll bring Get you back up right. later on. But anyways, like, I got sent down, went down to the minors, went down to Hershey, um, started living on top of an ice cream, <laughs> on an ice cream, on top of the ice cream parlor, the cone. Yeah. The, the what's it? King cone. King cone. Yeah. Um, spot. It was funny. And then I didn't get called up again until that next year. So when I got called up, you know, I get to the plane. I'm walking onto the plane. And uh, Nicholas Backstrom just kind of looks at me and goes, hey, Obi. That was a pretty long two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and, no shit. Thanks, and Mackie. the whole plane just started dying. Like everybody oh, that's was good. Just dying um and then i think you know after that you know i played i think i played a couple games that that call up and then like you said you know just a deep roster and uh but it was uh i learned a lot you know i think it what did you learn things where you're what did in you the learn? minors and you you're constantly working and grinding and pushing yourself uh because you want to play at the NHL level. I mean, you do have guys who kind of give up, but you know, I've, I've just never been one of those guys, you know? So, uh, I think I developed, uh, a lot in the minors. I had a lot of good coaches throughout my six years in Washington, even, you know, last year being in the minors in Colorado, I had some really good coaching. So you just, you learn a lot. It teaches you a lot. And then when you're in the NHL, you appreciate things so much more. Um, oh, I mean, come on. Like a back to back NHL, when you're playing a three and three, you know, your third three and three in a row. Yeah. It, hum- it humbles you. You can't wait uh, to play we a back to back. I don't know NHL. where it was. We were in somewhere. We we're playing back to back. And some guy came up to me and said he like felt bad for me. And I'm like, man, I've been. <laughs> I trust me. I've, I've had, I've had rougher weekends. I've played a three and three with a afternoon game in Bridgeport at 3 PM. Like, you know, two games. Remember the game. Remember the game. We won all three games. We were at Hartford on Friday night. We were with the Hershey bears. Troy Mann was our coach. Yeah. Uh, who's with Belleville now, uh, the Ottawa senators, uh, American league club. So I think I'm almost positive. This is it. And correct me if I'm wrong. Obi, but I, I, we were in Hartford on Friday night. I think we won an overtime. Seven o'clock game. So we get back at like three in the morning, whatever. Uh, by the time you unpack your gear and, you know, hit up the McDonald's drive through or whatever. Um, you're playing Saturday night, 
7 p.m. at home in Hershey, Giant Center. And then we bust out right after the game, but it was bad weather. It was a 1 o'clock game on Sunday. We got to Bridgeport. We got to Bridgeport at like 5.30 in the morning. I think it was a kid's game. Yeah, yeah. It was a kid's game. So I think it was even earlier than that. Even earlier? It was like 11 a.m. It was 11 a.m. I think I was talking about this actually today with um, one of the boys. Eleven. It was like an 11 a.m. game, and there was a snowstorm. I know exactly what you're talking about. And I didn't sleep a lick, man. I couldn't. I I was just crawling on that bus, trying to find a way to get some Z's. And like, I don't know. I don't know if I had too much coffee for the Saturday night game, but like, I was in one. Well, we got stuck in the traffic. Yeah. And then we we're like, well, are we actually going to play this game? And we nobody was. No, no guys were like, well, I I, I guess we are. You know, <laughs> I'll never forget. I'll never forget Manners pregame speech too. He just like came to the locker room. He's like, well, boys, like we already won the weekend. Like get greedy. Just go do something tonight. Like go do something to win the game. Like try to pass, try to be good on draws or something, block a shot. And we were actually money. Like we zipped the puck around, you know, we look like the Russian five out there, line after line after line. We were a pretty good offensive club. And, I, I think we beat up on them pretty good. Well, we had we always Born had good three. teams. We always had great. We teams. We always did, and and being great on a good teams, team, the American great League's guys. A um, like the amount of good hockey players that I've played with in Hershey, it's insane. Like, um, just so many good quality hockey players come out of there. Well, you said something. Something I think I I did a nice job of as a, as a younger player, but you know I've I've been in the NHL, you know I'm back in the American League. You've been in the American League. You're back in the NHL, you know. So we've both been on both sides of the fence, right? And I'm going through it right now. We're in the American League. Like you cannot quit on your game. You cannot quit on the effort and the belief and the conviction that there's there's a stone you can look under. There's something you can do to continue to improve your game without losing all the things that have gotten you here. You know, you've always got to, you know, maintain your identity. Um, and, and keeping a strong self-talk, you know, believing in that, you know, you'll, you'll get your, uh, your bus pass again. Um, what were some of the things that tools you would use during those years in Hershey? Like individually, were there any specific skills uh, within the game you worked on? Were there any mental skills or books that you found particularly helpful to maintain that conviction that you were able to maintain. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's so many things I still do now, you know, that um, like I'm, I'm big into writing. So I write a lot. I put a lot on, on paper. Um, I do it. I do it every day. Um, I write every day. So that's, that's a big part of how I prepare um, and also how I let go of things. And I think important skill in pro, especially being in the American league, there's, you know, you're, you're, you're expected to be great every night. And it's such a hard league to be great in every night because not only the schedule, the travel, but there's so much competition, right? You are there's competing so with the guys, the guys, your friends every single day. And it's important to, you know, you're going to have bad, everybody's going to have bad games. And I think for me, I let bad games hang around too long in the past. And still to this day, there's nights where, I come home and I have a hard time sleeping because I feel like I just didn't do enough. And writing for me has helped me be able to let go of a lot of those emotions, um, a lot of those bad plays, those mistakes. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's helped me a ton. Is it something that you would recommend uh, for a lot of younger players to to try? What is it you mainly write about? 
what prompt do you use? Like, what do you, do you have any questions you ask or you just kind of free form, write What's on your mind? A lot of it's free form, you know, um, I've tried to, it's, it's funny. Like I've tried different ways before of kind of having it like, okay, I'm going to do it this way. Like I'm going to have all my, put everything I desire here put everything that, you know, I want to go well tonight there. And it was almost like it just didn't flow. It just didn't feel like it was real. It wasn't authentic. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And I think when I just kind of grab my book and I start writing and then I look back and I read it, everything that I, everything that I wanted to accomplish, I accomplished within what I wrote. Um, so, I mean, obviously the biggest thing is you got to be positive. Like you got to say, okay, well, what are the things that I did really well tonight? You know, you write those things down and then you go over, you go over the bad things. So you go over the things that went wrong and you make sure that you're accountable for them. And then you make sure, all right, how can we make sure how, or, and then you, you say, okay, how can we make sure that this doesn't happen again? You know, what can we do? And then that's kind of how I approach my practices. It's like, all right, this didn't go well that, you know, in the last game, right. I wasn't, I wasn't moving my feet enough. I wasn't, I didn't feel like I was protecting the puck well enough. I go into that practice the next day and I'm grabbing somebody after practice and you know, we're doing, we're, we're battling, you know, I'm grabbing, you know, the, the biggest D man on my team and I'm saying, all right, push me around. Right. Cause then you, you that's how you regain your confidence. Having confidence. Yeah, you gotta work through, you gotta work through the low spots. Yeah. You gotta go yeah. back to where it was tough. You can't run away yeah. from the weak spots in your game. Yeah. So I think that's, that's what's helped me the most. Hogs, Hogs is chiming in. Hogs is chiming in. He feels the same. He's like, you know, there was a couple of treats today that got away from me. And uh, I'm going to let you hear about it. I'm not happy. No, I, I appreciate you, you, you saying that because, cause, you know, I, I think people be shocked. And I know I'm a big mental health advocate. I know you are. It's something that, you know, we play a hard game. It's a very judge. It's, it's the nature of the, of the sport entirely. It's you're literally being judged on your, your play, uh, the aura you bring to the room. Uh, you get judged from head to toe in this game. It's just part of the gig. And uh, but the the more you kind of peel the layers of of different players and different guys, everyone's kind of got their their self soothing techniques, their their forms of visualization. Sometimes it takes a writing form. Certain guys will have music they'll listen to pregame. Other guys will have you know sort of their post game hobby, whether it's you know Braden Holtby bringing his you know guitar on the plane, like guys whether they know it or not, are investing in their well-being and in, in their holistic uh, ability to perform, you know, night in, night out. It's a, it's a grueling sport. Physically, it's going to take a lot out of you. Uh, emotionally, you know, like you said, especially in the American League, you're competing against your friends. Uh, there's 35 guys on the team. You know, there's no cap rule. They can have, you know, as many as they want. They got, you know, 20 forwards looking for ice time. Um trades, prospects, college free agency signings, like you're in the meatloaf, you're in the thick of it. Um, you know, so help me understand. I know Hershey was a big part of my career, uh, in a, in a springboard for you. Um, but you end up in Colorado's organization and you have what you thought was going to be a big free agency opportunity to finally, you know, you'd been kind of stuck looking for a change of scenery, uh, and you have a big injury. Um, what was the injury? What happened? Uh, how'd you get back? And then, I mean, hell, by the end of that year, you were, you were back in the NHL, you know, with your probably one of your more permanent stays since you broke in. Yeah. Um, man, that injury was crazy. So, I, you know, free agency gets pushed back from July 31st to, I'm sure you know the date. What was the date it got pushed back to? October something? Oh, for, for the actual COVID, COVID year? Because of for COVID. For the short year? I don't remember because I, I still had – I remember last year's because I was UFA that year. Oh, yeah. Man. No, no, no. It's yeah, okay. So it got pushed back 
You got pushed back like two, three months, right? It's a long time to be waiting. And so I was like, all right, you know, I'm training hard. I was training and going to the bubble. Found out a week before the bubble that I wasn't going into the bubble. So I'm training, training. I'm in great shape. Um, I get home and, you know, obviously back home, things were, were really locked down, especially in Canada, the East Coast, Nova Scotia, uh, you know, even more so than a lot of the other provinces. And so just on the field training, uh, just doing some explosive jumps, movements, and, and boom, you know, Achilles gone. Um, goes, you know, I, I knew going into free agency, there was a good chunk of teams interested in signing me too. It was my first, first opportunity to go to another organization and have a fresh start. Um, and it, it, it completely dist- like it, I was destroyed, you know, I'm, I'm crying You know, I was, I was crying. I was like, oh, like being told, you know, I'm not going to play. I'm not going to be able to play for nine to nine months to a year. Um, and, but then I was just like, you know what? It's going to be, I think, I think I, again, I, I went straight to my book and I wrote down, I said, I, I am not going to be a victim. I am going, this is going to be a great story. I, I knew from the point, I knew that I was going to get myself out of that hole. I knew I wasn't going to get an NHL contract because of my injury, but I knew that, you know, somebody would take a chance on me in the American league. And then I would prove myself, you know, again and, and make, make my way back to the NHL. Um, But yeah, it's just, it's one of the, you know, I get emotional even talking about it because it was such a hard moment, um, especially as an athlete. You don't know if you're ever going to come back from an injury like that. If you're, if you're going to come back the same, you know, I was told, you know, you, you might not be able to skate the same way as you did before. Um, you might not be able to run the same way, you you know, you were you were able to before you might not have the same explosive power um you know so there's just so many things right um but you know i had a great support group some really good doctors um you know adela my fiance was incredible throughout the whole process my family was there for uh, a lot of the process as well and they they helped me with everything that i needed so it was, um, it was great. And then all of a sudden, you know, I get to Colorado, really awesome group of guys with the Eagles, great coaching staff. Um, the physios, everybody took, you know, did a tremendous job, you know, getting me healthy. Coaches did a great job getting me ready to play again. And then I, I'm able to go in there and, perform at a high level and then get myself back onto an NHL contract and, and play in the NHL with them last year, you know, another, you know, another really good hockey team. So, uh, it was just, yeah, it was, uh, a humbling experience. Yeah. I think, uh, I've talked about injuries a couple of times on this podcast with different players and, I don't know if I've ever talked with someone as serious as, you know, an Achilles rupture, um, you know, but for any young player that, cause I I've gotten direct messages and things like that from players all the way up through, you know, division one NCAA players, OHL players, the younger kids, 14, 15, you know, Hey, I hurt this. Hey, I broke my leg. Hey, I, and uh, there's a good chance if you're a young player, listen to this, like your favorite player has had those, career ending question marks happen to them. You know, from Sidney Crosby on down. Um, you know, we've all had some sort of injury where we're sitting there wondering, I have worked so hard 
to work on my game. I, I have worked so hard to build this skill, to build, to build this strength. Uh, and it's gone. Like that. Or at least inaccessible for now. And uh, I think that's really powerful what you said about, you know, saying, you know, I'm, I'm going to do my damn best to not be a victim here. And, and to... We start feeling sorry, sorry for yourself, saying. right? It's just so easy to feel sorry for yourself, and well, and you know, the what if game. What if I, what if I didn't do this? Like I, I should have known. Yeah, yeah. Like I remember, even you know, I was in Jersey, right? And we're, um, I was in Jersey, and I was kind of fighting. I was in the last year of my deal. I really liked it there. I knew the coach, you know, had had a lot of faith in my game prior, but you know, I was just kind of on the outs at this time. I'm like, if I hang around, you know, I know I can get a consistent run and I'll, I'll make them believe again, you know? And it was, it was at the start of the season where there's just so much shook up pressure, right? It's, it's such a sprint out of the gates. Everyone's trying to lunge for as much ice time as they can get special teams, roll power play, penalty kill, whatever. It's a very formative time, right? The coach, as soon as they have, you know, first success with a the player, they kind of have some trust and then they're willing to go back to that formula the rest of the season. Right. And we're doing like power play penalty kill and Nikita Gusev, you know, kind of takes an errant shot and I, I wasn't really in the lane. And it's funny. You've got me on one side. I'm thinking, you know, I'll block anything in practice because I just want to get on the kill. And I know Gusev, they were, you know, up his ass pretty good, um, you know, for not scoring. And, uh, you know, they're were, they were yelling at him to shoot more even in practice. And I was taking away the far side of the net like you usually do when you come out on like the Ovechkin spot, right? Go Gusev's a righty. So same, you know, at that, you know, right dot, uh, goalie right. And it kind of flutters out and, you know, shatters my pinky. Like I'm totally in one. And like same thing. I'm just skating to the bench, you know, at the end of that practice. I'm like, that, that's it. Like I, I was trying so hard to, you know, get back in this lineup. and Yeah, yeah. It's, um, you just, what if, you know, you, you, you say, what, what, why didn't I come out more aggressively? So the shot hit me earlier, you know, why, what did I really have to gain by, you know, staying in that lane? Maybe I should have been a little bit over, you know, like there's a certain way, you know, vets kind of practice to know how to get the most for their game, but minimize their risk for injury. Right. Like, why didn't I do that? And, uh, but it, 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 you got to be gentle with yourself at some point. And then eventually once you do that, kind of let yourself down easy and say, Hey man, like, you know, maybe that day you could have warmed up better, better, you know, with your Achilles, maybe not. You yeah. know, maybe you overtrained, maybe you didn't. Um, maybe you didn't eat right. Hey, we're here now. And uh, it might be a six month recovery. It might be a 10 month recovery. Um, but I'm not going to beat myself up for it for, you know, for, for damaged goods, for spilled milk. And you learn, you learn a lot from those experiences too, right? Like, I think I, I take such better care of myself now yeah. than I did before. I'm so much more aware of my body. Um, mentally, I had to, you know, meditate every day. And I've just made, I've created so many good habits from that experience because I was, every day was like, you know, I was fighting with myself in my own mind, yeah. you know, and it's one of those things where you, you're almost at the end of it. You're almost grateful that you went through it because you just, you learned so much about yourself and you just evolved and you got smarter. What was that like when you signed your NHL contract with Colorado after that injury? What was that day like? And then the eventual call up. Yeah, that was just a, just relief. <laughs> it's like, okay, like, thank God. Like we did it. You know, like I, I, I told myself I was going to do it and, and we did it, you know? And then, you know, I ended up getting 12 games there. And, you know, now I'm here. You know? So it's. How's it been in Arizona? It's been great. Um, 
awesome place to live. Tough, yeah, when, you're, John tough, tough the... when you're white like me, though. <laughs> yeah, you're spending <laughs> half between escrow and uh, your suntan lotion bill. Yeah, yeah. You're getting hammered. <laughs> uh, but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's been great. Obviously, we haven't had to start this season that I don't think, and, and, you know, nobody wanted what we're, you know, where, to be where we're at right now. Coming off a big win. Um, but overall, just coaching staff is awesome. Uh, organization has treated me really well. Group of guys that we have are just high, high, high quality people. Um, I don't know if I've actually played on a team with this many high quality people. So yeah. um, I think we're going to surprise a lot of people. A lot of people are you know, giving us a hard time right now, obviously, with the record and everything. but. I think we're going to surprise a lot of people. We just have, we just have a really good brotherhood and just a really good group of guys. And I know that we're going to get ourselves out of this. So, uh, yeah, a lot of names with a lot of guys who've you know been through quite a bit of adversity of themselves. Not not that I'm too familiar with it, but just from watching certain guys' careers over the course of you know the last uh, you know few seasons and things like that, uh, veteran group. Older group, proud guys. I mean, I was with it in Toronto, right? At the end of the year, we're, you know, we were in last place and, and all 20 guys came in the rink every day willing to do anything to win. Yeah. yeah. They, and Toronto's a tough and, place to lose, too, with the media. It's a tough place to lose. You had guys, stuff, right? you know, and trying to. Distractions. Yeah. And that's the beauty of the NHL player. You know, I know, you know, GMs and organizations have, you know, plans and different ways they structure different things, but. The effort, you know, 98% of guys give night in, night out is, is really, really special to reflect on. It is such a competitive sport played by such consistent and fiery people. And, you know, that's what makes the line so narrow, right? That's what makes coaches so mad is, hey, man, you're, you've been so good for, you know, 59 minutes. What were you thinking on this shift in the second? Like, what were you doing, right? Yeah, and uh, in the grand scheme, the mistake was you know minuscule, but you know lost details are lost games, and and that's the beauty of our sport. Yeah, like details are everything. For me, it's for me, it's for me, it's the difference between playing and not playing. You know, especially in my role, you know, you're a fourth line guy, and you don't have that. You don't have a lot of leash, you know, I'm sure you've been in that, you've been in that situation as well. Like there's just not a lot of leash and, um, that comes with, I think it's, it's a hard job, but it comes with a lot of preparation and it's rewarding when you have good nights and you're like, okay, you know, maybe you didn't get a goal. Maybe you didn't get a point, but you're like, Played a good game tonight. You know, I was detailed, made a lot of the right plays, made some really good reads, um, you know, finished all my checks, had a good presence. You know, those are the games that you feel honestly the best about. It's so true. And 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 you just know as a player how hard earned they are. You know, you'll you'll visualize that little backhand dink, you know, middle pop play to the center. You know, you'll visualize that play a hundred times before you make it once. Yeah. Um, or, you know, a two on two where if a forward comes across the blue line, you extend your stick and you get the ski ramp going and he puts his shot in the netting. Like that's as good as a goal for you know, a, lot of third <laughs> pair, a lot of third pair demon in the, in the league. It's a good feeling for you. It's not a good feeling for the forward. No, no. And uh, that's the cat and mouse. That's the beauty of, of the NHL game. And, and I think I, I do want to pivot a little bit to, you touched a little bit on writing meditation being important for you. Um, and if that's, you know, personal, you can keep that close. If you want to share on, you know, a little bit about, you know, how you do it, you can. But the question I wanted to ask was, you know, what is something you do within the NHL schedule that you feel gives you, a, gives you an edge? And this can be, you know, on the ice or off the ice. Wow. I mean, I do a lot of 
like I, I, I meditate every day. Um, meditation, breathing as well. Wim Hof. Um, that stuff gives me an edge, you know, it, you need to, you need to have a clear mind when you go to the rink, you, you can't have a clustered mind at the NHL in the NHL. You got to have a clear mind. You got to be up. You got to be at your best every day. And it's not just for the games. Like at practice, you got to be dialed in. You got to be detailed. Um, you can't have a bad practice. When you're in the bottom half of an NHL lineup, that almost makes a coach more angry than a bad game. Oh, they, no, there's just, there's no room for having a bad practice when you're in the bottom half of the lineup. There is, there's, you know, every pass needs to be on the tape. Um, I'm, you know, I'm almost more nervous to practice sometimes than, than I was, today, you know what I mean? I was. So I think just preparing yourself every day as if you're playing a game is just the best way to do it. And that's what I try to do. You know, I wake up in the morning. I put the right things in my body. I take 20 minutes to prepare for practice with meditation and breathing. Then I get in my car and I go to the rink. So I think for me, that's, that's what's helped me have success in the American League. And that's what's ultimately gotten me here is just creating good habits, creating that healthy routine of preparing the right way and, um, you know, executing. And you're big into that, right? Like you, I don't know if there's anybody that takes their preparation more serious than you. Um, and a lot of that, believe it or not, like when we went to that conference and we met, um, Giovanni, who I still talk to, Giovanni, by the way. Giovanni, well, all those people. You know, we met so many cool people. That was one of the coolest things I've ever gone to, you know, and I'm grateful that you invited me along because I learned so much from that. You know, I follow all those people on social media and, um, I've read that book, uh, uh, performer. Yeah. High performance habits. Yeah. I read that great book. book. Two to three Richard, it's a great book. Yeah. You know, I'm, I, I go back to that book all the time. You know, let's say I'm in a slump or I need something to kind of like get that edge back. I go back to that book and I think, you know, that's helped me a lot. Right. I think that's, I want to, I think that's something that I really admire you for is, you know, when I look back over the course of your career, like, and I, I know you really well, right. Cause we were roommates. So we talked about youth hockey and, you know, you played for the Toronto Marlies. Uh, you played at Notre Dame, right. Uh, the Notre Dame. The Hounds, yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, 10th overall, right. In the queue. Yeah. yeah. To not being drafted in the NHL to having multiple contract offers in your first initial training camp to being on the team to being in the minors for years and years and years to getting hurt to getting called up and now to be back opening night you know on a roster like you've been able that's what i consider physical fitness you know if you and i were to do a mountain on the ice a 60 second drill the old classic you know herb brooks you know a, a good physical test might be you know graded a couple of ways one how fast can we go down and back, you know, up, up and down the rink? That's one way, you know, skating speed. And then, you know, how repeatable is it, right? How quickly can you rest so that you can do that same score again, right? And then how long can you persist? How many can you do? Can you do two reps the same way? Can you do 20 reps the same way? And that's something, that's how I've tried to look at mental fitness and resiliency, right? It's like, all right, fine. You got knocked down, you got up again but can you do it twice? Can you do it without resentment? Can you do it with that same opening night positivity and, and excitement to play on game 40? And it's interesting. I, I've had, you know, you're not the first person to, 
look at me and say, you know, Connor, you do it really well. Like you, you, you know, you have a routine and you meditate and you do the breath work and I actually learn it from you. And I, I find it an interesting compliment because it takes a lot of work for me, man. Like I'm into all this stuff, not necessarily because I, I need it. Right. I, I don't feel like, I feel like that's a coming from a place of, you know, victimhood, like, Oh, I'm a, a special snowflake. No one else has doubts and worries. You know, I'm the one that needs to do all this special uh, preparation, right? Everyone yeah. else is fine. And, and I'm just trying to get back to their level, but it, um, it, it, it's, it's a yang yin sort of thing. Like I'm, I'm a naturally curious person. I'm a naturally, uh, I'm, I'm very invested in what I'm doing. I'm very, I'm very passionate, but with that comes great pain when I fail with that becomes, you know, perfectionist tendencies. I mean, you've seen me, you know, tie my skates 30 times during a, a game before. <laughs> you know, and uh, I think I've really just appreciated your resiliency. You've always worked hard, which which everybody does, but you've you've worked hard with like you you've got edge and you've got bite, but you're not like bitter to be around as a team. You know what I mean? Like, because I've I've played with that guy too, where they play with edge and bite and things like that, but they are just an asshole all the time, and they have to because it's now it's the persona that they. They don't know how to take the mask off anymore. You know, it's become yeah. so blended. And, uh, but there's, there's just so little resentment. There's so little resent, uh, bitterness left over. I'm not saying it's not there initially, you know, when you snap your Achilles, I'm not saying it's not there, you know, uh, when Hershey doesn't pick up the phone and, and, you know, try to help you in, in free agency after all you've done in the community and things like that. Right. Um, but there's just a freshness to you that I hope you're proud of, man, because it's not easy. It's not easy, man. It isn't. It's that constant battle, right? With yourself. And it all comes back to the word belief, right? And then having that unbreakable faith of, okay, this is what I want and I'm going to get there but just continuing, continuing to have that belief oh, like every single day, every moment, continuing to remind yourself, like, you know, cause you're going to, everybody goes through those doubts of like, you know, am I good enough? You know? Well, and I think that you talked about a little bit, the, the summit Liam was talking about Liam and I, I was in Toronto and I was really into, um, you know, the, the blended coffees, the bulletproof coffees and the Dave Asprey was talking at the event. That's actually, and, and Dr. Mark Hyman who wrote a nutrition book called uh, food, what the heck should I eat? And I'd, I'd read that and I knew who Dave was and I wanted to go to this event because they were speaking in Toronto and I ended up meeting uh, this gentleman, Giovanni Marcico, who put on the entire event and totally, we only went for like half a day because the other two days we were skating and things like that and, and couldn't make it. Um, but it really opened us up. I'll speak to my own experience. It was a, uh, an event for entrepreneurs who want to, you know, basically live and work in the, uh, wellness space. It's, it was a room full of, of, you know, high end dreamers, people who were out there, you know, trying to make a difference in the world. And, uh, it was interesting to listen to their stories of trials and tribulations and their, imposter syndrome issues and their uh, difficulties to manage energy levels, you know, on the road, right? Imagine you're Brendan Burchard and you've got to talk in front of that many people 200 nights a year and it's the same talk, you know, and you've got to give it every single time. Like it's the very first time you've done it. You know, that's a special skill, you know? And uh, I think it really opened my eyes that, okay, like some of the issues you might want to run away from in hockey, they're not going anywhere. Like they're going to be in something else too, man. So you might as well stick with the battle you're in. Yeah. There's always going to be curveballs, obstacles. Always. And you, I think as a hockey player, you got to be prepared for that and have the tools to overcome those things. Right. I've thought a lot about that word prepared, you know, and, and it's funny, right? Like the old school pro, it used to be, you know, they, they drink a couple nights a week, they'd work out, 
kind of. And then they would show up in August, unzip their bag, skate, you know, two, three times a week and show up to training camp, you know, skate the booze out and go and play the season, right? Now you've got the modern day athlete, like, you know, we were talk- talking about it before the podcast, uh, a 12 year old AAA player, their schedule looks like ours. You know, they're playing 60 to 100 games a year. They're playing summer tournaments. They're in the gym three days a week, maybe six days a week, an hour to two. They're on the ice on top of that. They got their figure skating coach. They're working with Adam Oates. They're working with Daryl Belfry. They're working with Brian Kane. They're working with, you know, whomever, right? Um, what's next? You know, like what is prepared? And I, I think it's a little bit, it's going to, Bleed but into do you think? Do you agree these, with that for kids? Because I don't. Not entirely. Not entirely. I don't at all. I think it's. I think these kids got to be kids. Like I think. I, I hope so. Be, but here, here's what I think, though, Ob. It's almost like. It's kind of like when we, bag skate our heads in before training camp to get ready for those first couple of days. It's like, is that really the best method to get you ready for the NHL game? No, you don't. You, you you play 10 minutes a night. When I was a third pair of D, I played 14 minutes a night. It's not physically tiring. Why are we bag skating? Yeah. Like what I really need to be working on is like that middle pop play that's going to get us out of the zone or not. Because if it doesn't get out, like I'm in one. I'm not getting any more ice time tonight. You know, or that's when you are going to end up tired because you got to defend for, you know, against all four lines, you know. But you kind of, you have to do it because you're not, you, you can't afford to be the guy to show up last in the skate test. You're, you're off the list. Yeah. yeah. So it's a little bit with these kids. Like, I get it. Like, I, I'm sympathetic to that. Like, I think they are skating and working too much just on hockey. I think they should do other things. I think they should have some summertime off, right? Um, things grow in space, right? Like, there needs to be empty space for things to grow into it, right? Like, you need to have a gap from some of your last games to... Uh, be able to evolve into new habits, right? Um, and I don't think you just rest your way to a better nervous system for hockey, uh, but I do think you can burn out for sure. But on the other end, this is what I'm talking about, like kind of the next evolution of athlete. If the demands aren't going anywhere, right? Like the 82 game schedule isn't going anywhere. Uh, you ask most NHL players, how many nights a year do you have your abs- absolute A game, right? Like, what's that number? Is it 20 games? Ooh, is it 50? A, is absolute it 50? A game. I mean, it's got to be, it could be less than 20 games. It could be less than 20, right? Which means to me, it's a, it's a, it's a war of attrition. It's a B game league that you're seeing. Everyone's trying to have the best B game possible. Why? Because they're hurt. They're traveling. They played the night before. It's their 11th year in the league. And frankly, it's just getting a little monotonous and they can't wait for the playoffs because they do want to win more than anything. But it's a Tuesday and, you know, they're in Columbus. You know what I mean? (laughs) Right? Like, and it's raining and, you know, they got olive oil on their suit at the, you know, team meal. And they're just like, you know what? (laughs) I'm I'm sick of this shit. Olive oil. That sounds like something you'd do. It it was it, it I check half my you. suits they're all ruined. Um, Olive oil in Columbus, but I do you think that, Columbus. I do think that that's something where the breath work, the meditation, the you know, it's almost like uh, when you meet you know a Navy SEAL for example, right? When you listen to the way that they talk about being a Navy SEAL, like it's something they, like they'll still be in, they'll be in their graves still doing this shit. You oh, know yeah. what I mean? Uh, sort of the, 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 the warrior mentality when you meet, you know, uh, a certain black belt and you listen to them talk about the art of mixed martial arts, right? Like, so in my mind, being a soldier, uh, being a mixed martial artist, these are like really refined, uh, paths, right? Like it's, it's been in practice for a long time, right? Being a pro hockey player is relatively new. It's not that old as a league. Right. In relation to soldiers, for example, you know, right. People have been fighting since the day, uh, since the beginning of time. Right. right. You know? And so like, I just, I wonder if, you know, if, if the talent level, it's only going higher. People are only going to practice more. No one's going to say, you know what? I'm actually willing to let my kid get cut in the spring 
Um, I'm not going to let them skate. Like, that's a tough call as a parent. I get it. You know, because I get these phone calls. Hey, what should my kid do? And if, if you can't take away from the stress, you might as well really be able to invest in the stress management and actually uh, enjoyment, right? And you know this, like, you can have your back up against the wall, played a bad game. You, you know you're probably the 13th forward going into practice today, you know, but you're not sure. And, uh, but you, you got your mind right. You had coffee in the morning, you know, you slap cold water in your face and you say, you know what, Liam, you know what, Connor, like last game's over and uh, 13th forward or not, you know, seventh demon or not, 12th forward or not, sixth demon or not. I'm going to have a great practice today and we're going to see what happens. And then all of a sudden you show up at the rank and you check the name, you know, you check the, uh, the lineup. Oh, you're in it still, you know, and you go out and you do a great job anyway. And uh, I think there's more and more room in the game. I, I don't think it's going to be. One of the questions I had on here for you was like, what is something uh, training? What's a training tactic that you've ever tried that would be considered like the most outside the box for you? Right now, if I feel like 20 years ago, you were to ask the average NHL or like, hey, do you do breath work before the game? And most <laughs> of them be like, come get on, out of here. they'd be like, get kick, out of here, kick rocks, dude. Get, yeah. You know, yeah. give me a smoke. Right. And, uh, yeah, that's their you know, but, now, but now it's a little bit more common. They're in the old Montreal form hacking darts between periods. Exactly. Exactly. You know, but so what's what's the next level? You know what I mean? Because it's coming. The game's going to grow. It's always evolving. And uh, I think it's fun to think about. Yeah. I don't I just I I think, you know, you got to have as a young kid, you got to have that balance, though. Like, I don't disagree with you. Think, in less than balance, like think, you got to have some creativity and you, there's just no creativity in doing the same thing every day. No. You know, you like there's other movement patterns and skill sets that you can acquire in other sports. You know, so for example, like people use the term head up, but no one's playing hockey with their head up. Like it's generally a downfield, like you're, you're kind of staring down and almost like this, you know. Um, at this different angle where, where you're kind of, you can see out of the top of your eyes where the, you know, the NHL or hockey play is being played, but you're kind of looking down 10 feet around you all the time, right? Like, like you're looking to pass under sticks you know, versus, you know, uh, baseball, you know, say you're taking fly balls, like you're training this entire differently, different field of vision, this entirely different range of, of depth, right? Like the field's so much bigger, the field's different. Um, Versus soccer, right? Like you have to learn how to defend. You don't have a stick. There's no such thing as getting like close enough. You can just have a good stick and poke the puck away. Like soccer, you got to move your ass all the way over there and, and take the ball away from someone, right? One of the best things I ever did, it totally changed my game. I played football for one year in seventh grade, which with all the head trauma and stuff like that, maybe it's worth it. Maybe it's not. You know, I know football is not the most advisable thing. It's, it doesn't it's really not, matter for guys like yeah. you and me that play the way we do. But like one of the best things I ever did for learning how to handle physicality was I played football for a year. That was just me. I'm not saying every kid should play football. It would make you more comfortable. It wasn't even what I did it on purpose. It was just like, it was something I learned, you know? Um, and and I, I think that with other sports, you have opportunities that hockey can't provide. It, it can be a training stimulus for life for sure, but also for the sport in a way that's unique to those sports. Hockey is not every other sport, you know? And I think I look at the NHL and I look at a lot of the best players in the league. They're just very athletic, you know? Which also, I think there's something to be said about, you know, Cal Dietz uh, was a guy whose program he used to use for training and stuff like that at University of Minnesota. And I've listened to him on podcasts and he talks about how like, you know, the Navy SEALs, they don't develop any tough people. They just find tough people, right? Like the, the, the program's tough and just the ones that survive are the tough ones, right? And I do, f there's a little bit of that truth to that in hockey too, 
you know, newsflash, like there is sort of a genetic ceiling uh, for certain people. Most people never come close to it because they don't have the work yeah. ethic, yeah. right? Um, but a lot of kids or a lot of parents think that they're like creating this NHL or, and, and I have a kid now, so I, I've spent a lot of time, you know, thinking about what, how do I want to parent? How do I want to, if he wants to play sport, how do we introduce it? How do I, you know, parent it or, or coach it or be around it? Right. And, uh, it's like a gardener doesn't grow flowers. All it does is create an environment in which flowers can grow. And I think that, you know, for, for kids sport, that's my best advice going right now. If I, if I come up with a better idea, I'll I'll share it, but it's like, you can kind of create an environment where, yeah, a pro athlete could grow out of it, but like you're, you're, you're not going to make chicken salad out of chicken shit. You know what I mean? Like if if there's certain kids that there's a certain level of coordination that innately just isn't available to them and that's okay. They'll be great at something else, but you got to be the kid that's waking your dad up at, six o'clock in the morning to get him to take you to the rink. Not the kid that's, you know, got his dad waking him up at six o'clock in the morning. It's got to be the other way around. You know, you got to yeah. be dragging him out, out the door. Right. Like you got to really want it, especially you if you really play at this level. And, and in this sport, like you're going to get your teeth smacked in. You're going to break stuff. You're going to separate oh. a shoulder. You ever separate a shoulder? How'd that feel? Not good. I mean, I, I've, got, I've, got, I've, had, I've gotten punched in the face a lot of times. So it doesn't feel nice. Those don't feel you know? good, you know. Um, man, we'll have to do a. I don't, I don't want to keep you all night because I know you're, you know, practicing stuff tomorrow. Um, this was a lot of fun, Ob. I miss you, man. And it was good to catch up with you. Uh, you know, maybe we have to do a round two and talk about. You know, when you got me hit by, by yeah, Brett Kalan all those times. We got to talk, talk about We got to talk about what went down at the. At yeah, the, the Halloween track. party. And uh, what was that? It was a 22-22. Was it Flintlock? Flintlock, yeah. yeah. Good Flintlock. Memory. I still got the playlist on my phone. You have to tell the story about when he jumped off the bench and took a two-game suspension. Was it two games? <laughs> oh, no. All right, on, fine. Man, we'll, that. we'll end with Liam O'Brien. We'll end with this one. Fine. This is from from uh, the living room, the, the story where we're playing the Bridgeport Sound Tigers. And I was given the game before I pissed off uh, Cam Jansen. And I, I he was barking at me, smoked me the first shift. I ran him in the third. He got up without gloves on. And I gave him the old seatbelt. And this was after our captain, uh, Garrett Mitchell. I think it was Garrett. Was it Mitchie or was it Dane Byers? Dean Byers was the captain then, yeah. I think it was Byers. He came up to me and was like, listen, do not touch this Jansen guy, okay? Just don't even look at him. And uh, I looked at him, and so whatever. And uh, that happened. And the next game, we're playing Bridgeport, and Brett Gallant's on this team, you know, famous AHL tough guy. And Byers, he's like, okay, listen, asshole. Like, I know I told you don't touch Jansen, but don't touch Gallant. I'm like, all right, man, I got it. Got it. Cool. Understood. And uh, Gallant is on the ice. He he does a middle lane drive. I kind of pick his stick, you know, give him like a cross check to keep him from going to the net. And he drops his right glove and is just punching me in the gut in the middle of the rink. I'm like, dude, come on. Don't embarrass me like this. Like, we're not doing this. Stop. Just fucking stop. Like, put your glove back on, you know. And I'd had, you know, some fights and penalty minutes and things like that. But I just wasn't looking for it. And especially that year, I was you playing look at the names on your so fight card. It's pretty impressive. Yeah. Uh, who else was that? <laughs> Not a big deal. Or, yeah, we had. I had a. I had a good run that year. I was playing my offside. I got hit from behind a lot, and my ice time was fluky. So like I was for whatever reason that year, I played like twenty two minutes, and then one night I played like twelve. So you know, coach forget about me, and I get all well, that was, pissed that was off. The last like a year with all the heavies. That was the yeah, last year. Yeah, that was the last year, the and then the next year the league changed. So. Gallant picks his glove back up, leaves me alone. Well, like the next shift, it was a five on five brawl. The goalies fought. So six on six brawl, actually. The goalies fought. Phoenix Copley, you know, leaves his net. He's fought. It was on ESPN, they, you know, full Yahtzee. Like the guys are going at it. And Brett Gallant grabs me, and I'm just not happy about it. Because I've heard stories about this guy, like, you know, uh, he's pound in, for in pound different the fights. Toughest. He's a pound, pound for pound the toughest 
guy in hockey. Yeah. yeah, he's 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 it might as well be, you know, Ty Domi out there for, you know, for our modern game. Right. Like you might yes. as well be that guy. Seriously. And I'm like, he's we're, he's grabbed me and my back's to the full to the rink. He, he's got it because I'm facing the glass and he can see the full rink and he's just he's cocked. I'm cocked. We both grabbed each other and he's like, come on, man, hit me. And I'm like, stop, man, we're not doing this. And he's like, come on, like, just let's go. And he's messing with me, you know, he's, 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 I'm, I'm, you know, he's got me, he's got me in the, in the, in the hooks right now. And I'm like, man, stop. Like, we're not doing this. And, uh, and all of a sudden I hear over my shoulder, don't fucking touch him. And like really close to me. So it kind of scared me. I'm like, fuck, you know, who is that? And all of a sudden Brett Glant goes pop, pop. Pops me twice, <laughs> pops me twice, <laughs> like hard, man. I got smacked. I don't know why I looked over my shoulder in the middle of a fight. Like that shame on me. Oh. And it was you, donkey, got off the ice and we're yelling at Brett Gallant, like a true roommate. And I love you for it. And, uh, but I, you know, we were joking after the game. You'd, you'd left the ice. You'd left the bench. I think you were in suspension. I, Where'd you get this? I left Tripped the bench to try. I was trying to tell him to let go of you to come fight me. And uh, the line, he grabs me and pushes me back. I step on a stick and I fall. One of the most oh, embarrassing man. things ever. Oh, <laughs> me too. Up, I'm sitting there. I'm going sitting back there. to the bench. I end up getting a two-game suspension. Two-game suspy. We're in an argument after the game. You're like, man, you owe me. Like, I came out and stuck up for you. I'm like, I don't owe you anything, man. He <laughs> left me alone until you came out there. Which really pissed me off. You know, like, wow. we were both mad at each other. Um, <laughs> he left me alone until you came out there. Yeah, but I knew it wasn't going to go well. <laughs> so I was just trying to make sure you didn't. Get my it. my whole goal was to make sure it didn't go at all. We were just gonna kaput the whole thing. And uh, man, we had a good time. Me, you, and th- this is another Very, great Eric Bergdorfer, one of my yeah, you know know. favorite teammates and classic. You you learn so much about yourself in the minors, man. You really do. And, uh, like I remember, you know, Bergdorfer, uh, you know, was a good player, older player, uh, big, heavy guy, strong, dependable, better offensively than most people gave him credit for. And, you know, our coach, you know, would play him a lot at times, you know, the year prior and the year prior to that I was in the NHL. So all of a sudden, you know, I'm, you know, maybe a little entitled and think I should be, you know, having a bigger role and. You know, he's playing this Bergy guy and and I don't like it. And all of a sudden we're roommates and, you know, we're lifelong friends. And like, this is, this is the, the balance, the blend, the dance that is, you know, minor league hockey that um, if you don't wish it away, you can really learn a lot about yourself and, and develop yourself in more than just the arena of hockey. Um, it can really be a, a, a fertile grounds for, you know, personal development. And I know it was for me. Um, interestingly enough, there's actually another story I'll share with you, Obi. I thought this was cool. And I know you got a million of them too, but there was a guy I played with. I won't use his name just because I didn't ask him, but we were with the Bears together my first year pro. He was a demon. I was a demon. I'm with him later with the Marlies. I'm tearing it up. That was the year that you're chirping me in the playoffs. I'm telling you to shut up. Or I'm going <laughs> to not pay your Comcast bill, you know? And, uh, you know, cause we were, we were roommates when I got traded and, uh, we played each other in the Eastern conference finals and the same player we we're going to eat and, uh, a lot in the hotel. Cause we'd both gotten traded to Toronto and he goes, you know, see, I got to tell you something, man. And I'm like, what's up? Like, this is weird. We're eating sushi and like, you're just broing, broing out me right now. What's going on? He's like, uh, I got to apologize, man. I'm like, for what? He's like, you know, we've been going to eat a lot. Like we get along great. And man, I, I, I feel bad because I remember your first year pro and I wasn't very nice to you. And I didn't like it because we're competing for ice time and I'm a bigger man now and I I shouldn't have been that way to you. And I sat there and I'm like, wow, really profound that he would apologize all these years later, you know, like it's, it's impressive. And, uh, I looked at him and I go, you know, that's funny you say that 
I said, because I actually remember like three or four guys on that team because I was kind of a know-it-all rookie. I'm like, and then this was back when rookies still got a little a little tough. I won't say tough, but a little bit compared to what it used to be. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I'm like, man, I remember you being like one of the three or four guys that was actually good to me. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, I thought you were one of the ones that liked me, man. <laughs> So like that. Well, just because you always, you off, always, it's because everybody, you're always yipping and yapping with everybody. That's why. So you, you know, probably actually, thought, you probably thought, oh, I gave this guy such a hard time. I was chirping this guy every day. But there were two still people. Does he that, know that you love to just feed off of that? Oh man. So so there were two people that really taught me. You're one of them. Um, Troy Mann. We had a we had a quiet team. We had like Tim Kennedy who didn't say boo. You know, Chris Nothing. Connor was quiet. Uh, Chris Newberry was quiet. You know, he would, he Chris, would yell, but he, both he was those guys, quiet. Chris Connor and Chris Newberry though. Awesome. Like, oh, the best. They were all the best. They were all had conversations with them. When you did get something out of them, you were just like, you were so excited. Tim <laughs> Kennedy. Like, oh, Chris like, Connor. Oh, man, I had the best, I had the best chat with noobs today or like, you know what I mean? You just were so excited. Chris Connor would come up to me and, and, you know, be like, Hey, we got to go do what Yager did yesterday. I had a buddy who's playing with Yager. I heard he was shooting 45 pound plates in the hallway. We had to go shoot that on the, on the carpet in Hershey. And we'd be trying to take wristers with 45 pound plates, you know, down the hallway at me and Chris Connor. It was just. God, was he ever strong on his stick though, man. Oh yeah. Well, that's, well, he well, was that's a, why. A you know, anyway, he was, yeah. He was unbelievable. Skate forever. He was never tired. But so that year, Troy man pulls me aside and goes, Hey, you know, you like the buzz on the bench. Like we need that. We have a dead bench. Like we, no one talks. And so I know you're a young guy. You're only 20 years old. I don't care. You know, I need you talking. I was like, okay, thanks coach. Yeah, I will. You know, and it, and it was good for my game. It got me into yeah. it, you know? And uh, this is just kind of a classic, like you gotta be yourself, uh, you know, type story. And so whatever I, I would do it and then I wouldn't play well. And I, you know, I'm, I'm not playing good. I I don't have shit to say. You know, yeah. I, I'm not going to tell the boys like we got to pick it up. Like I need to pick it up. <laughs> yeah, like fuck. And I Troy man, at myself. And Manor called me in and was like, "Hey, I know you're in one. I know you passed the puck to the other team ten times last <laughs> night, but I don't care. Like I need you talking. I need you getting into it. Like your game sucks when you go quiet." And you were one of the other people that actually said that, you know, we were talking about overthinking and, and, you know, coming back from bad games. We're talking about whatever. And, uh, I, I said, I can't remember what I said. I said something like, like, yeah, you know, I, I, I feel like I've, I've, I've been in a funk. Like I, I just haven't been, you know, totally myself. And you're like, and you said, yeah, you've been super quiet. That's always the tell. And then, you know, so I just kind of had two different angles, two different people, both with my best interest at heart saying like, listen, man, like I know you're going through something tough, but like you, you got to show up as all of you. You can't just, you know, pick and choose, you know, based on how your game's going. Like you gotta, that's, that's part invest. of being a good teammate too. Right. Like, you know, maybe you're not having a good night, but like help, help your teammates, you know, help encourage them, push them, compliment them, you know, make them feel good. Whether you're having a good night or not, it's just, I think that's a big part of this game, right? Is just helping other guys have confidence. And, you, you know, you've, you're good at that. That's something you're good at, right? Like you're an enthusiastic human being, right? A big part of who you are. And, you, and it makes you feel good too when, when you see your teammates, you know, go out, have success or have a big shift, score a big goal. You know what I mean? Well, you know, you, you want to have fun doing it, man. You know, and you want guys to miss playing with you. That's really what it's about. Yeah. You want you want to you want to be missed on the ice for sure. I mean, I I, I did. off the ice too. I don't know if I've played with another guy who's got the same dance moves as you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, still, like, I'm still waiting. It's been. Oh, uh, man. Undefeated. Locker room dance champ. I tell everybody I know twice. Um, I'm working Especially on the TikTok spandex. Dances. Oh, man. That, like, the tightest spandex you can find? Like well, mediums. Schmediums. Wash them on hot. You know, <laughs> the, the industrial grade. Drive them on even hotter. Fabric nose favors. When, I mean, when you got quads like me, man, it's just. 
you know, you're going to do the best you can, but <laughs> hard to contain them. Um, that's why he likes he married you. That the money makers, man. That's what they are. Those are the money makers, baby. You know it. No, I know it. I know it. <laughs> um, Ob man, you're an original copy. I uh, I always love talking to you. I uh, I appreciate you jamming. Not easy as an NHLer to step out and talk about anything about yourself for any length of time, uh, but I appreciate you know the oh, sensitivity and do it again, what man. I got we got so yeah, we much will. more to talk about. We do, we do, we do. <laughs> we didn't even. Um, yeah, we got so much more to talk about. I'll be on here. So, well, that's your homework then. I want you to remember uh, some stories we missed and some things we want to talk about the next time. Uh, we'll have a round two, maybe in person. Maybe I can get my ass called up. Um, you know, we can do one in uh, person in AZ or in, in uh, Seattle. So, uh, you will. Um, no doubt, man. All right, man. I love you, brother. Thanks for, uh, thanks for this. And I hope the next time I see you isn't at your wedding. I hope I see you before then. But if not, I'll get my liver ready uh, and we'll have a blast and uh, just get your dance. Moves I, uh, ready. Oh man. They, you don't have to get them ready if they're always ready. You know what I mean? Back pocket, <laughs> back pocket. All right, brother. I love you. Thanks All for right. uh, having too. me on. And you uh, too, yeah, whenever you, whenever you want me, let me know. <laughs>